Good morning. It's September 2nd, 2016, the morning after uh, the Ellensburg Rodeo Hall of Fame induction ceremony, where this year's inductee, Miles Harris, uh, joined us. Miles, tell us your full name, birth date, and birthplace. Uh, Miles Winston Hare. Um, I was born in Gordon, Nebraska in 1955. I'm 61 years old now. Tell us a little bit about your folks and your people. And well, I was born into the game. I mean, uh, rodeo's a hard game to get into. Um, it's not like buying a basketball hoop and having it sitting on your backyard and you go, go shoot you hoops every night or going to the tennis court and hitting the ball. I mean, all cities have that. But my father happened to have rodeo stock. He was a stock contractor. We produced rodeos at the amateur level. And uh, I had, you know, 40 head bulls down there in the pasture. If I wanted to practice, I run them up, got them in, put a plank on them, and tested them out, you know. Was the, was the testing riding, or did you? Well, at the time, I mean, I got to tell you, when I was, uh, when I was 12 years old, I wanted to fight bulls. I, I understood. I, I, my father had bucking bulls. I remember my, my job was when we go to rodeos when I was 10, 11, 12 years old, was to get in the semi that was hauling the bulls to the to the to that rodeo. When they got there, my job was to make sure they had water, make sure they had the tubs out to grant cake and feed them. And, and I, I was pretty savvy about handling livestock. And we were, we were uh, hey, we we're cowboys. I mean, and up there where I'm from, the sand hills of Nebraska is where I was born. And the, the biggest money in the game around there was people that owned big ranches. And I drug a lot of calves through the fire. I understood livestock pretty well. In fact, I always had better communication with four legs than I did too. <laughs> you told us a little bit about your uh, adolescence. Well, yeah, I was, I was, we were speaking about um, how I kind of got into bullfighting. Um, I, uh, I remember when I was 10, 11 years old, I, I used to lay down by the catch pin and I'd watch them bulls buck and then I'd watch them come trot out of the arena where they'd strip up the flank off of them and, and if a bull rope hadn't come off, they'd take a bull rope off them bulls or if they had one drug in, they'd take the ropes off the bulls. And, and I was always just fascinated by, by bulls. My father, he was a roper and um, he, he really didn't like bulls. And he thought bull riding and it was a pain in the butt. They were hard to keep in. They were dangerous animals. They were hard to handle. He always worried about one of them hooking one of us kids around the place when he wasn't home and, and stuff like that. He, his favorite uh, event was not bull riding. <laughs> but that was probably what made me gravitate to it. He wasn't telling me how to do that all the time. Uh, I, I had a lot of success in uh, other events in rodeo. I was all around champ two years in a row at the high school level. I was a Nebraska State High School bear rock riding champ. I was a Nebraska State High School calf roping champ. And I went all around my senior year. Uh, and still, I, uh, I, my, in, at the bottom, back of my mind, I knew that I would probably be a bullfighter. And, and I went ahead and got on a lot of bareback horses the first year I got out of high school. But uh, that bareback riding, I gotta tell you, bareback riding might be the toughest event I ever, I ever participated in. Sometimes I had to go fight bulls to heal up from the bareback riding, if that's hard for you guys to believe, but that was kind of the way it was, you know. And, and so I, I always gravitated toward them bulls. And what was difficult for some people on them was, seemed to be pretty easy for me. Most of the time when I was fighting bulls well and when I was in my prime, it was kind of like taking candy from a baby. Watching it look like that. Yeah. I mean, it, a lot of it, once I understood a little more about it, I remember years ago, I used to study matadors. And then anytime I'd go to a new town, I would, I would go into the library and try to find books on uh, different matadors. And, and finally, uh, one time I went in and I found this article about Carlos Aruza. Aruza was one of the only matadors from Mexico, from Mexican soil, born on Mexican soil, that had went to Spain and become number one in the world, like Manuel Etle and, and some of the great Spaniard bullfighters. And in this article, uh, Aruza had wrote a, a, a piece that was called, the, art, the name of the article was Anticone of Immunity. And it was his theory on how bulls seen what they seen. 
and he, he um, explained about bulls that would not break, that would break from a close distance, and a, some bulls that wouldn't charge you from a long ways away, you'll see a bull back up and paw, drop his head and back up and kind of wait, and pretty soon all of a sudden something triggers a strike, and that bull just comes to you immediately, you know, and Aruza, he explained that, he, 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 uh, he said when you're working the cape on them bulls, there would be far-sighted bulls and near-sighted bulls. And he said if you'll look at a bull's face in the back pins before you fight him, he said that the bulls' that eyes were set around in front of their face, more or less what we might call pig-eyed bulls. Those bulls, there was two cones, a bull seen out to have cones similar to what you would see in a depth finder underneath a fishing boat. Yeah. And, and those two eyes where those cones come out, where those cones crossed in front of those bulls, if them bulls had them eyes in front of them, they were nearsighted. Those cones crossed at a closer point in front of them. Them bulls you had to get closer to to trigger a strike on them bulls. Now, them bulls that had their eyes at back set on the side of their head were far-sighted bulls. And they could clearly, and where them cones crossed, he said, were, as where that bull had perfect depth of field, and clear vision of you. Anything on either side of outside of those cones to the right or the left was called a friend zone. And you, they could see you, but you was a blur coming out of it. They didn't have good focus. So in that, that where you wanted to hang with the bull? Yeah, well, I knew quickly that that's why when I was coming in at angles behind those bulls, that they wouldn't detect me until, and if a bull bows his nose down, those cones go into the ground, they seen the ground and things that were low. Most predators on animals in the wild are from the ground. And a lot of the things that bulls and uh, cattle had to protect themselves from were wolves and dogs and cats and, and big cats. And, and it was natural for them to see good on the ground. God made them that way. Was there any veterinary science to I, support this? I, 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 I had nothing but what Ruza had wrote in the yeah. article. But Ruza had fought bulls, you know, with a cape and killed bulls his whole life. And I had great respect for... You didn't need science. I, well, I, I put his there. theory to the test every day in the arena. And I started, seeing, I started seeing that, hey, there's something to what he's saying. And that there was something. And it also, it freed me up when I felt like I was out of peripheral vision of the bull. And in the friend zone... I knew when I entered that zone and when to enter that zone, that's when I could distract a bull. And that I could also move around without distracting the bull and without messing up his bucking pattern when I was out of that friend zone. Just as important as being in. Just, and, and it just, I mean, there was a lot of things. I, I already had a good idea about it. But once I read that article, I said, man, there, there's a lot of truth to this. Did you ever read that back? I, oh, no, he got killed in 55. I was just, uh, the year I was born, I think, the Rusa. 55 or 56, he wrecked a jeep on his ranch and got killed. But they did a, a, a documentary on Aruza, and it's it's a it's just the coolest that. piece. You got to see it. It's called Aruza, okay. and they never finished it. It laid in in uh, uh, they 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 filmed a lot of the footage of him fighting bulls and stuff. And this film had laid there for years and years. And 15, 20 years after he got killed. They come and finish this deal out, and I've got a tape of it and watched it, and I've had several tapes of it every time. I, one of my buddies ended up with the page. It's a cool deal. You need to look it up. Well, I'll bet a guy could Google that and find it nowadays, the way things are today. But, but Did anyway. Did you have any snatch style bull fight? No, I didn't. I never taped any bulls, and I, you know, I, I wasn't, they killed the bulls, and the, yeah, you know, and, and that's another thing that we had to deal with. I mean, I quickly learned that, that bulls learn from repetition, just like a horse does. That's why you run a calf rope horse out there and rope a thousand in practice, because you teach him exactly what you want him to do, and it's almost like muscle memory training. And bulls are the same way. After you'd put, if I put seven or eight fakes on a bull to the left and broke around him to the right, he's going to start looking for it. And you, you had to learn to keep track of where it, your tracks and where you've been around that bull. And if I had a bad fighting bull and a freestyle bull fight, and I knew, he, you know, every bull is like a human being. They're right-handed or left-handed. Every bull will favor one lead versus the other lead. And it's up to you to do your homework and figure it out. And if you haven't seen that bull, then you've got to be a quick study. The first time he runs at you, you pop that left on him. If you feel like he kicked this right lead over real quick when he broke, you broke around him, 
and he was slower to kick his left lead out, well, then you had to exploit his weakness. Got some other territory to cover here, but I can't. But I, I, you know, and I don't want to put a school on here. I do teach schools, and I talk about some of this stuff to my students, and this is stuff that it took me thousands, a hundred thousands of bulls to, you know, I fought over 10,000 head of bulls at the Houston Rodeo alone. And I don't know how many bulls I fought in my life, but th these theories are, you know, I, you put them together by practice and one, before, <laughs> before you start believing it yourself, you got to convince yourself you're correct. That's it, yeah. And, but to believe in something, I mean, you've got to, there, a man's got advantages over the bull, but it's not speed, okay. it's not strength. Bull's faster than you, he's stronger than you, he, he's got every advantage in the physical game. But you got your head on him, and let me tell you something, man, if you don't use your head, then he's going to exploit your weakness. you got to be unique in terms of bullfighters with this kind of... Well, I don't know how... Attitude as a student. I don't know how other bullfighters can have the confidence without having the knowledge. Uh, what made me feel like that I could walk in the arena and I was going to walk out of that arena is because I knew I had my game together. I knew where my advantages were at. And let me tell you something. I took hooking after hooking. And the, you got to learn. First off, you're not dealing with mechanics. Everything else, everything that I deal with that has a mind, and they're going to break pattern. Okay. It's not always going to be the way it's supposed to be. And if I'm doing something wrong, i got to separate me making a, a small mistake in the arena and taking that hook from a bull just beating me at the game. Because then if you start, if every time you get hooked you want to change something, and sometimes the bull just beats you, then you start get second guessing your own philosophy of how it should be done. And you know, you have, you have to learn that, hey, you're going to take some hookings in this game, and, and I'm talking about, this is a lot to do with freestyle bullfighting. When you are in there protecting cowboys, then it's all about scenario. It's if the cowboy gets thrown down right in front of that bull, and he's right there in that scenario, you're probably going to have to take a hook. The cowboy got ripped down over his head, the bull, you're, he lands two feet in front of the bull, you're back again the buck and shoots because you don't want to interfere in the bucking pattern of the bull, and it makes it a very difficult save to make. So scenario changes everything in cowboy protection. But when they turn a fighting bull out and he's running at me in the arena, I can set him up how I want him. And I gotta be ready to do that. But when I'm protecting cowboys, hey, or react in the that's right, I mean, protection zone. In the, and, and when a bull throws a cowboy out the back door and he's coming back around to see him and you step in between him and the bull, hey, that's what you're looking for. It's going to look good to the crowd. It's going to be an easy setup. And that's just what you want. And they go, wow, how do you ever get in there? But that, that was an easy save, even though the bull looked bad. But when that bull rips that cowboy down over his head and he's already got an eyeball on him, and the toughest pick in rodeo, the toughest cowboy protection pick in the game, is when a bull throws the cowboy straight in front of you, and he's looking at you over the cowboy, and he's already eyeballing you, and you've got to come in. That bull frees you up with his eyes. You know he's already, you're the target, and he's waiting for you, and the bait's laying right there. And when that scenario comes down, that's, that's the toughest pick in the game. And that, that, you got to make a decision laterally or That's right, hey, I'll tell you what you got to do. you got to see if you got the guts to take care of the man laying there. That's where it's at. That's where it's at. That's when, you're, that's when you're, you get your test of why you're in this game. No if question. you don't have ice in your veins on that scenario right there, you're screwed. That's how it is. You know what I mean? And, 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 I, uh, um, and, I, and, that, and that's exactly what you try to avoid. When you see that cowboy coming loose and it's a possibility that he's coming toward you, you've got to relocate where you're at quickly. You've got to react to the, what's going to happen. You've got to anticipate where the man's going to hit the ground and beat the bull to him. That's what cowboy protection is all about. And if you can do that, and, and you can do it. I mean, I, I, I've done about a thousand in a row. But there'll be, you know, 1,001 might be the one you make a mistake on and you'll pay the price. But uh, that's what it's all about. If you watch Tuckness today, Tuckness is about as good as there is coming from out of peripheral vision. 
and coming in under them bulls and, and really has he really he must be a student as well. I mean he's a he's a top driver. He taught, well them guys had the, the 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 thing that they had was that video had came along and they had studied our films and they studied Smitty and I and our fakes and the guys with the strongest fakes and, and you can incorporate each each one of us have a weakness and a strength. Sure. I've never I've never watched a bullfighter I didn't learn something from. Yes. It might have been what not to do. But that might be just as important as learning what to do. You know what I mean? So there's never been a bullfighter that if I didn't sit there watching close, I couldn't learn something from. Just Paying just attention is what else. Just a good competitor. Yeah, yeah. There's no doubt. I mean, you got to be on top of it. And, you know, I mean, it's a scary-ass game. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it don't, it don't take that, that in itself. Yeah, I miss string wonder. Break the barrier, so what? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, that, that is right. Yeah, I mean, in other events, I mean, yeah. and, and I, I got a lot of respect. I, I, I rope, and, and I still uh, train a few rope horses, and I team rope with some rope who's an angle with my son, and rope a little bit with my stepson, and he's a cap roper, too. And, uh, and I love it. I, I do love that. But let me tell you, I tell him when things get tough there, I say, you tie some fleets on someday, when you have a bad day, you'll be cleaning dirt out of your jaw. <laughs> Not being mad because you've got a 10 second penalty. <laughs> Good call. Uh, grew up in a rodeo family in uh, South Dakota. No, Nebraska. born in Nebraska, right on the South Dakota line. My father's uh, name was Dean Hare, and he put on rodeos at the amateur level. I had a lot of influence from a man right there in town named Buck Buckles. He partnered with my father and helped my dad put on some rodeos. His son was Jerry Buckles and headed for uh, Gerald Camarillo at the finals one year, the team rope. That was one of my headers in, in high school rodeo. Uh, and I, uh, you know, when you got a guy, a kid that goes on to go to the finals and team rope, well, that's probably why I had a little bit of success yeah. healing for him. You know what I mean? He was a heck of a hand. Well, when you guys were, uh, uh, at that spot in your career, when you were growing up, when did you first think about or know about the Augsburg Rodeo? Well, um, I had went, the, there was a movie that came out called Great American Cowboy, and there's some pieces in there that showed the wild the horse race at the Old Max Stampede, I believe, going down in the water there. Was that Mayhem's deal? Uh, and, May, and let me tell you, okay. and uh, uh, late in the uh, early, the early 70s, I, uh, I got to protect Mayhan, and I guess I got my card in the spring of 75, I believe. And Mayhan and Quintana and Lafew, and they were the they were the studs then, man. They were controlling it. And uh, I, uh, I I got to know Mayhan a little bit. I got to protect him, and, and I'd watched the movie Great American Cowboy, and I knew when I, I was a kid and I walked out of that theater that night that I would meet those guys. I was on a, I was I was bound and determined. And I got to know Mayhan a little bit, became really good friends with Lafew, and always admired Quintana in this, the, how mentally strong <laughs> Quintana was. And Quintana was the guy that was going to ride the rankest bull in the game. He was. And, you know, he was kind of like the Jim Sharp. And uh, um, it was, uh, you know, I was already fascinated with it, the bulls. And then I, I got to know some of these guys, and uh, I was on my way. I mean, I... Even though I never aborted roping and quit my the other events, I, I went full steam on them bullfight. I, I, I focused on bullfighting, and, and uh, I was bound and determined to get someplace out doing it. I should know this, Miles, but your first trip to Ellsberg was when? Well, I, when I was telling you about the Olmec Stampede, I talked visit with Mayhan. I told Mayhan and Lafew and a couple of them guys that I knew had been to the Northwest Rodeos. And, of course, they, we had heard a lot about Pendleton and Ellensburg and all these rodeos up here okay. have, have a great reputation. And Mayhan told me one time, he said, I don't know if there's a better one than Ellensburg, Miles. He goes, that's, that's quite a rodeo. And, and he was pretty high on it, and so was Lafew. And, and, uh, and it's, as soon as I worked the finals in 77, I was wanting it. I didn't yeah. get it for a while. It took a while. Yeah. See, it's, in, in bullfighting, you're your own agent. You're, you promote yourself. I had a little, I had long hair and a beard, and I was a little bit wilder than some of them. And, I, and when I come to your town to fight bulls, I also come to your town to see what was happening downtown. You know. And I went downtown to see what was happening in your town. <laughs> 
And I did it again last night. And, and I'm going to tell you, though, I mean, I, that's why I traveled. I was, I, I've always wondered what was on the other side of the hill when I'm driving. I always, when I'd top a hill, I would look. And if it had been a place I'd never been before, I'd go, what, how, how Got lucky I am. Job, how lucky I am. Yeah. And rodeo itself is, what's the biggest weekend here in Ellensburg each year? You know, this rodeo. It's this rodeo. The biggest weekend in Gordon, Nebraska, where I was a kid, was our county fair. The biggest weekend at Houston. You explain it to people. You're going to the community that's celebration. It, there it weekend. is. And that's what you do for a living. Is your job is go to their biggest year, and you get it all year long. Yeah. And I'll tell you what you better do. You better pace yourself. <laughs> because there's a lot of so The strong. United States is big, man. Yeah. The United States is big. Oh. We've talked about some of the contemporaries. Uh, are there specific Northwest guys that you remember? Or, uh, well, I... Um, besides I, Ellensburg, did you work at other social or Yes, or? and I, you know, I, I come up here, and, and I knew Wick was up here. That's I knew Wick sure. was from Bow Washington, and, and, and Wick was one of my heroes. And let me tell you, Wick didn't like long hair or beard. And he was under the bus for a fair bit. So he was, you know, he was a little, and and I I told Wick one time at Rapid City, South Dakota. He looked at my hair and shook his head at me, and and I told him, I said, hey, I I tell you what, we're in a bullfight, and and I'm not going to get my hair cut for you, but before I'm done, I'm going to get some of your money, and you're going to respect it. <laughs> and he Wick he, Wick did like that. You know what I mean? Wick respected that, and before we were done. He was one of my mentors. You know what I mean? He was, he wouldn't bother him at all to say, get your hair cut. It's huh? boy, but he's got right. the hair yeah. But uh, at the same time, too, I learned a lot from him. I worked this rodeo here. And we, him and I worked the chariot with old Texas Red. That bull was a pretty intimidating bull. And I remember one time I was in the chariot, and Wick jumps out of the chariot, and this bull takes a run at him. And he steps by this bull, and that chariot's dragging behind him. And this bull shoots by him, and Wick puts a little bag on him. This bull's about this far from him. And he takes and makes a, goes between the chariot and me and the bull. He makes a pass through there. And I was pretty sure that I was not going to do that at the age I was at. And Wick was, you know, this late 40. Oh, hell yes, he was at the end of his career, you know. And this old man was still doing stuff like that. That's how tough Wick Beth was. That's how mentally strong he was, too. And I go, Wick, man, I said, you could have got killed. And he comes, oh, that was nothing, you know, you didn't even know. I don't think I ever seen a scenario that shook Wick up. He was that steady mentally. He was that strong minded uh, man, and he was physically tough. Oh, Wick would take a hook and him, and, you know, and he'd get up and walk off. And if it did hurt him, he, he, the only person would probably be known would be his wife. You know what I mean? He'd walk out of the pen and act like nothing shook down. And, and I did see Wick go through some brutal injuries on the bullfighting tour before he quit. I'll never forget at Fort Smith, Arkansas. Uh, Arkansas, Smithy and I uh, were both youngsters and at the top of our game, and we had Harry's pin, and both of us had been mauled out in the arena a couple of performances and skinned up a little bit, and we went over there. We was worried about which one of us two was ahead of the other one. We get over there to look at the sheet, and Hell Wick was 50 years old, and he was ahead of both of us. <laughs> we were worried we about the wrong guy, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and uh, the next night, Wick had drawn 141 Harry's, and the Crooked Nose was the one that had the big reputation 111. This 141 was actually a tougher bull to fight than Crooked Nose. He didn't ever get the, 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 uh, the I, I thought he was. Now, it's a personal deal, but I thought 141 was one of the toughest bulls I ever seen. And this bull hits Wick right between the eyes and knocks a hole in Wick's forehead. Blood was just squirting out of Wick's forehead. And Wick walked by me and blood squirts on my shirt out of his forehead when he walks by me. And I, I think maybe you need to go see the medic. Wick goes, there ain't nothing wrong with me, and walked off. You know? And, and uh, I always think back when I'm whining about stuff, I wonder how tough Wick was with Fort Smith that year. And maybe the guy needs to keep his mouth shut and get the ice packs to get away from him. That's a little. You started your rodeo career in the early to mid 70s miles. And uh, when did you finish? Uh, I quit at Houston, I think it was 2008 or something. I think I was 53 years old. 
And I believe Wick was 52, and I wanted to go longer than Wick, and, but that didn't have nothing to do with when I re retired. But when I hit 50, um, you know, in Houston there was a 20 performance rodeo, and uh, usually it was 20. There was a few years that I worked at that it was 22 or 24 purse. But it would run almost a month long, and um, you know, before they limited entries, you would fight a lot of bulls in the slack at Houston, and it was a tough rodeo to work. And, and by the time I, you know, I was there 31 years at the Houston Astrodome, and by, by the time I got to the that last year, I, I told them, I said, hey, I, you guys, I, I, you're one of the only rodeos to stuck with me this long, and. I, it's the hardest thing I ever did was not fight bulls. The hardest thing I ever did was to quit fighting bulls. And I, uh, I told them, I said, this will be my last year. You guys are going to have to get somebody next year. And I told them the first performance of the rodeo. And when I, I actually had a pretty good rodeo, and they told me, you can go 10 years, man. We'll, we'll let you run the head camera. What do you want to do? And, and I, but I didn't want to go out at the bottom of the game. I wanted people to remember me as, as pretty much mistake-free. I wanted the Cowboys to still have faith in me. I wanted them to know if they got thrown down in front of one of them, they probably weren't going to get hooked if Aaron was in town. And, and I took pride in that, and I didn't want to blow that at the end. What's special about the Ellensburg Rodeo? Th this rodeo is, a, I'll, I'll tell you what, when you work, work a rodeo, like I said last night, for 10 years or, or more, you become personal friends with a lot of people in town. And, but that don't have nothing to do with school on in the and what is special about Ellensburg is the nostalgia of the rodeo. I can tell you another thing. When it didn't matter what corner that a bull would set up in if you went down there to fight a fighting bull to entertain people. Um, the, the stands were packed. There was people every inch all the way about around this arena and there was big energy. And we work off energy. I mean, it's, if you, I, I remember Wick said, hey, you can walk around out there with your shoulders down with poor body English, and all you're going to do is convey the message to the people sitting in the stands of Bach tickets. He said, if you want those guys to smile and have energy, you send them energy. And, and that, that was very important when he told me that. And, I, and it didn't take long for me to learn that, hey, these people are going to be on board with you if you get on board. Was Gardenhauer announcing that? I think Gardenhauer was, well, for years he was. I can't remember. I'm not for sure if old Chuck wasn't announcing here when I first came here. Yeah. Chuck Parkinson. Yeah. Did, well, didn't he work this for a long time? Yeah. You guys would probably know more than me about that. But Gardenhose was here for, or Gardenhauer. <laughs> and I love Phil, man. Gardenhose was cool. He was one cool dude, man. And it, he was a lot of fun to go have a beer with when the road goes over. Sure. And so so is Justin. Yeah, they're a couple of good guys. Yeah. And but you know those guys that uh, God bless those guys that have a silver tongue. They don't have to get skinned up quite like us boys and wear cleats. Party words, Miles. What would you like to share with? The well, you know, I, I things that rodeo had been so good to me. I never fought a bull without saying a short prayer before I went in there. I couldn't have done it without God on my team. And I don't know why I survived it as long as I did. But I have not a lot of regrets. I, uh, I hung it out on the line out here at these rodeos. And Ellensburg was one of the most special ones I had. I've got a handful of rodeos that I'll always cherish. Whenever I think about it, I smile. And this is one of them. And, you know, I mean, when you come to Ellensburg... It, what was different about it was the best bulls were here. The best guys in the world were going to get on. It was four days of compacted action. Mm -hmm. And it was the best. I mean, it, it just it was excellence. Mm -hmm. And I was always never with a weak bullfighter on the other side of me. I always had a tough gun on the other side of me and somebody that I had faith in. Mm -hmm. Somebody that I had enough faith in that there was no bull that I was worried about getting underneath of because I knew he was willing to hire two good guys. They're, they're they're even, they have the money. A lot of rodeos that hire guys like Rob Smith or Miles Hare have to hire a young kid to put on the other side because they don't get the crowd that you guys do. They're not established like Ellensburg is. And Ellensburg was a rodeo that you knew when you got here you was going to have the best guy in the world on the other side of you. You was going to have the best guy in the world on the bull's back. And you was going to have the best announcer in the world sitting in the stands to, to make the crowd re recognize what you've done. Got You're damn right. And, and I mean, it, the scenario doesn't get no better than that. And, and it, was, it wasn't hard to get pumped up coming here. 
It was the biggest deal. I'd always think, here, man, I got two more weeks. I got to stay healthy two more weeks so I can come into Ellensburg with some wheels under me. I just worry about my knees and say, man, and it is, bullfighting is, you know, your, your, your reactions and your feet do your talking in bullfighting. And if you don't have quick reactions and make good, quick, crisp decisions, it's going to catch up with you. And I just tried to come in here with my wheels underneath me and ready for Ellensburg because I knew it was going to be four days of some tough action. Well, Dan, thanks for the mentions and uh, taking the time to conduct this interview. If you guys had it half as much as fun as I did doing it, then we're all going to be happy. Yeah, it's a, I, <laughs> it was, I love yeah. it. I love it, man. It was a ball. Mm -hmm.